I'm going to be talking about old school programming. Now, as a as a game developer, when and like when I was a kid, I got a ZX Spectrum when I was ten, right? So I started programming at the age of ten, right? And when you're a ten year old, you program games, right? It's what else would you do? Um, so I've got a minute before I start, but I might as well just kind of you know roll my way into it. Uh, I think they'll record. So I worked with. ASCII representation. I worked with binary as a 10-year-old. And for me, my kind of whole way of thinking has been shaped by programming. I am a programmer. It's kind of deep inside me. Um, I remember going, like, it, when, when you're going through university, sometimes you drink a little bit. You know, just occasionally. Um, and for me, the bit of my brain that would leave at the end of drinking was programming, right? I could still program while drunk and get things to compile. I couldn't write an essay while drunk, right? Because, you know, the words would all get strange and the sentence would be crazy. But as a programmer, even as I get really tired and I've been drinking, I can still code, right? So it's actually really deep in the way I think. So I'm, I'm a really kind of old school programmer. I did my first professional programming when I was 10 years old. So, uh, rather, when I was 16, I did my first paid job. And I did the invoicing system for the local hardware store. So I did their, their stock taking and invoicing system and set up their database for them. And so they paid me at 16 to do that job because, you know, there weren't current software to do it, right? So um, I learned a lot of my programming back sort of in that sort of teenage years. Um, now, some of the lessons from looking at that sort of 8-bit programming, dealing with memory directly, understanding how computers work, helps us now when we're making games. All right? So today, I'm going to be talking about some of those kind of 8-bit lessons, what we were doing as kind of, you know, kids back in the, in the 80s, um, and how hopefully some of those ways of thinking can resonate, can connect, and can make be interesting for you guys who are now doing game development, um, if you're working in the creative bit here. Otherwise, you're just here to listen to me, and that's nice too. Um, OK, so I now I've got both of these, because Jervik has been merged, acquired, combined with NTNU. So from next year, I'm going to be an NTNU person rather than a Jervik person. So, um, so the, the course that I teach will be merge together. So we'll see what that looks like next year. Um, but so I'm kind of affiliated now, sort of, with both. OK, so 8-bit. So 8-bit, this, these are bits, ones and zeros. This is 8-bit. 8-bit yeah? gives you one byte. So 8-bit programs are kind of one-byte programs. But saying like one byte doesn't sound as cool as like 8-bit. Uh, games and they weren't called one byte games; they were called eight bit games. So eight bit gives you two hundred and fifty six options. Now, use base two and base ten. Um, this on my chest and that down there is both in the ASCII number format. Okay, so ASCII is the American Standards um, format. So it was a, um, it was a format created by a group of programmers. Now, the thing about programmers and the thing about computer programming is that in the 8-bit days, you never did anything that was wasteful, right? Because you had so little memory and you had so little process speed, you didn't just kind of bulk things out, right? You didn't just make things bigger because you could, right? You had to think about every single character you used, right? Now, um, if you're writing a tweet, right? If you try and say a lot in 144 characters, that's hard work, right? If you sometimes you think, okay, how, how do I? I'm, I'm one character over. How do I shrink what I want to say? Now, 8-bit programmers, that's all we did was to try and think, how do we shrink in things? So, in ASCII, it's actually kind of a packed representation. Now, 
if you are following along with uh, with kind of how ASCII works, then binary works by saying one and zero. Okay? This one is the ones column. This is the so this is either one one or zero. This is the twos, fours, eights, sixteens, thirty-two, sixty-four, one twenty-eight column. Okay. So what do I mean by that? Well, this is the number one. A one here would add another would add the value two to it. A value here would add the number four to it. So this, so that is four, and that is four, right? And this is one. Now this would add. 8 to that number, this would add 16, 32, 64, 128. Now, what I've got here is actually a 1 up here, which means it's only got, you know, this is the 64s, so it's 64 plus 4. Right? 64 plus 4 is 68. Right. Now, if some of you kind of know your ASCII, 64 plus 1 would be 65. A, right? Now, what's interesting is that this bit here in ASCII actually kind of tells you that the 011 tells you that this is, an, this is a lowercase letter and this is an uppercase letter. And here tells you the order in the alphabet that the number is. So A is the first letter of the alphabet. What's the fourth letter alphabet? D. So this was given to me by my sister when my, my, my daughter was born, right? This is my dad t-shirt. Now, interestingly, in the D, this is capital D, this is lowercase d. What's the difference between that top row and the, the, the bottom row? Just, just this bit here, right? This column is the capitalization bit. Right? If you wanted to change from lowercase to uppercase, what you did is you changed this bit from a 1 to a 0. That's how you did it. Because they didn't want, they didn't want to have to have some like, complicated math to change case of letters. So they worked out, OK, we'll, we'll represent case here. And here, this 0011, that is saying this is a number. 0011 in ASCII, that's a number. So what you see here, a, a number character, right? So the, the character's 0 through the character's 9. So this is actually the 8 plus 2. This is the character 9 in the ASCII system. And understanding that these things were not designed at random, Right? The reason why A is 65 was not just we randomly picked a number 65 and put it there. It's that, you know, it's that with a 1 here. And then we can count all the letters up from there because we've got the single bit we've turned on to make it a letter. Okay? So, if, and you can use this not only for, for ASCII. ASCII was one mapping that we used in 8-bit. We also looked at using graphics. So, this number here is 57 in base 10, right? Which is actually that spot there. In 8-bit days, what we did is we didn't actually have, you know, 8 bits per color channel, right? You guys use 24-bit, right? Three sets of 8-bit color. And possibly 32-bit if you're using an alpha, a transparency. In 8-bit days, we just... We didn't have enough memory to throw away that much data per pixel. And so what you do is you use this number to represent somewhere in this table. And at the moment, it's representing that position there, and so is a green. Now, or if you use the ASCII cable, it can represent the number, the, char right, the character 9. Now, if we have a look at Mario, um, we can actually have a look at some of the 8-bit representations of Mario. So if we have a look in here and I turn on the PUV bugger and I start that. Oh, I need to open ROM. Let's see if I can restart that ROM. Come on, wake up. 
Why is it on pause? Um, hmm? The pause key. Uh, where is my pause key on this keyboard? Oh. Emulation speeds. I can change those. Um, I've actually... How did it go into... Pause. Okay, well, how about I just close that program and I'll restart the program and see if I can get it to bring up. Um, because what I'm basically looking at is, I'll get back to it in a sec, is we look at reuse and we look at how you can deal with, with color. Now here, this was nicely pointed out, is that the bushes in green are the clouds in white. Right? So the idea here was, you know, I'm not going to waste space by drawing separate clouds to things uh, to, to bushes, I'll just reuse the bush's shape and change its color palette. So if I have a look, you can see here an animation of that happening. Um, if we go to this guy here, that animation is created by editing the color palette, right? So I'm not actually moving anything here. All I'm doing is changing in this table, right, which I was using to work out like what a, oh. in this table here, what I can do is go and pick this number. And instead of being green, I'll make it pink. So everything that happened to be in the image that was labeled as, you know, paint by numbers 57, I've just changed it and I've changed it in one place, and I've changed every color in that palette. And if we have a look, and I'll see if I can actually bring up that um, uh, ROM, um, nope. Uh, where is it gone? It should be. Open ROM. There we go, that's better. Now it's got rid of the pause. Okay, so this is Super Mario, right? Super Mario Bros. 3. Um, I'll make it, and I can turn on the debugger and the PV view. Now, you can see here, this is the view of the memory in that emulator. Right? Now, um, I had a friend who, who did a lot of, of PlayStation 1 modding, right? So he got a mod kit for his PlayStation 1, and he was making games for the PlayStation 1 and doing modding that in that community. And you got this sort of thing to look at, right? This is the memory. Now, what you can see here is this letter 3 is flashing, right? But instead of storing, you know, three versions of that letter and then trying to change this whole area of graphics, what it's actually doing is it's just flicking that single value in the lookup table. Yeah. And you see now we've changed the different headings and it's changed, changed out some of the textures. Right? This is a changing texture memory. Now each of those textures, these are on this screen, a, an area here is doing a lookup into here and then converting colors. And so that's how you get this, doing this wee flicking here to actually get this whole area is a separate number. Okay, so that's kind of what one of the things we did. We didn't add, if we didn't have to animate stuff, we didn't. All right, we worked out tricks. It was all about kind of how do we do this kind of trick to get round the limitations of systems. Um, so, and you can actually go in here and with this program you can edit the memory and you can play with the memory and you can you can you can hack into the old NES games and the old ROMs and kind of edit them and change how they worked. And you can play the games in there as well. So, I and mean, you can see here if I um, actually go on to player one, you can see me doing very badly at a, come on and go into the world. Uh, there, where are we? 
Come on, go in. Ah. That's the state one. Yeah. But you can see the, I, I was there, I, I've not got my keyboards working properly. But here you can see this is the, the color lookups. And these are the sprites for doing this animation and these animations. And what they're doing is they're changing what is happening in this lookup. So for all of these, this area is doing a lookup into this part of the ROM. And so what I do is to change something on screen, I change what's being displayed there, which means all of those, because they're just doing a lookup into there, get changed. Okay? So that's how we did graphics. We weren't kind of displaying whole screens. We were indexing everything. We were trying to find ways around everything. Um, now, in the modern day, this is what we have to do with textures, right? We've got massive textures now. We can't get them all on the graphics card. So we have to look at how we reuse textures, how we index into textures, how you put textures into memory, the order in which you use those textures. So you put some textures into, into the GPU, you use that texture, you then dump it out and put a new texture in and re-render the new stuff, right? So as a graphics programmer, we're still doing this kind of thing, right? It was just simpler to see in 8-bit days because we'd actually see what was going on. Now, we're so, like, there's so much between us as a programmer and the computer that we, it's harder to understand. So there's actually a benefit potentially of going back to this stage and saying, okay, this is the principle that we're using. Yeah, there's lots of complexity now, but this is the principle. So if we have a look, well, I'll just go back to prison. So. Color. That was one of the things we used to do, right? And we, we, we were quite good at it. And, and Mario, you can see that we did this kind of, you know, reusing assets we did a lot of. Uh, and here you can see some of the, like, more advanced textures you can use. And then, like, how you would use parts of those textures, right? And you'd map those to parts of an object. So if you've got a brick texture, you reuse parts of it to try and create those rich texture environments. You don't just try and create one whole single texture. You don't draw the whole texture. You try and draw patches. And what they do now is they have patches with overlays and edits, right? So you do bump mapping and you do dirt mapping and you can kind of change things so it looks like it's new everywhere. In fact, it's just reusing part of a texture. Okay. Um, and so there's that, that example of color palettes. And, and you can actually go and have a look at a whole bunch of these demos um, at Effects Games where they'll show you interesting use of color palettes where all you do, you have a picture, and all you do is change where that index lookup is. Procedural generation. Um, back in the day, right? Elite felt like a rich, huge world. Because it was a huge world. Because they knew they couldn't ship the size of the game they wanted on a cartridge or on a disc in any way, right? There is no way you could make Elite the size they wanted it to be and actually have all of that stored somewhere. So what you did is instead of storing the content, you store the process to make that content, right? So you store the set of instructions, the procedures that are used to generate worlds and generate content. Um, and this, I mean, if you do it well, then you can create varied and interesting worlds, right? So you start with what they call, like, you have a process and a seed, right? You have a seed number. Now, random number seeding uh, is like, a whole mathematical area in itself, but you can start with a number, you know, pick a random number between one and a thousand, and then I will use that number to make decisions as to whether there'll be a mountain here or a lake. And then within the mountain or a lake, is there going to be a tree here or a stone, right? And what I do is I just keep using that number and like multiplying it and dividing it and just keep iterating on that number you get, that seed you gave me. And that will generate a whole new world. And so with elite procedural generation was the key for it to be, to be a large world. So when you came to a new planet, it would use a new seed and just generate that new planet. One of the nice things about using a seed, right, pick a number between one and a thousand, is that every time you pick the same number, you get the same world, right? So you can actually have kind of, you can place planets, give them an, a hashing index number, and that's the number they use. So that planet, every time you go back, 
is the same planet. Okay? The challenge with that and challenge with these systems is how do you store the changes the player makes to that world? And the answer is, well, you don't really, you just let them respawn it, right? You don't, you don't try and save changes to the world. We've, we've got better at that, right? We've got better at saying, okay, well, what we'll do is, is, you know, we'll have that base world. And then, you know, if you kill some stuff or you change stuff about the world, then we'll just save a delta file. We'll save a file that says, that's how the world was, right? And it starts with this single number. And then I'll add these three things to it. And when you come back, it regenerates that world from all of the, the code that generates the world from that number, and then adds those few small bits of delta. And you see now, with procedural generation, this, these ice flows um, are all generated procedurally. Right? Um, and uh, Pandora, um, Pandora World was, was um, developed by a group of, of my colleagues in, in Dunedin, and it is a fractally generated procedural world. And they can generate massive numbers of potential worlds and make them look in various ways because they just have an algorithm that mathematically steps through the parameters that you've set. Right? So you only need to give it a few numbers and it will generate a unique world for that number. And you look at modern games and they're saying, well, you know, once you get up to around $100 million to develop stuff, um, you start looking at ways to save money a lot. Um, and you'll see that team sizes in game development now have kind of ballooned on the 3D asset generation side. The core programmers, yeah, still not huge, right? Because, you know, programmers are programmers. You can't put, if you put too many programmers on a problem, it doesn't actually make it happen faster, right? There's, there's something they call the, the mythical man month, right? Which actually kind of works out better if you use the mythical woman month. Um, because if you know, the idea is, you know, put more people on, on, on a project doesn't necessarily happen faster. Right? So if it takes one woman nine months to have one baby, how long does it take nine women to have a baby? Still nine months, right? I mean, there is a, you just doesn't matter how many people you put on the task, it doesn't go faster, right? And programming is a bit like that, right? Because you've got to have so much of it in your head and you've got to work together, you can't just put more and more people on it. Art assets, big worlds, you know, each piece of art is kind of separate, so you get huge art teams, but they're expensive. And so you try and find ways of minimizing that. And procedural generation, going back to the 8-bit days and say, how on earth did Elite make such a huge world on such a tiny budget? Well, you know, they use procedural generation. And so, going back to that lesson, saying, okay, what can I make from starting with a core and then just kind of procedurally generating the, the enemies, rather than having to hand draw every single tree in my world, right? I will make a speed tree, I'll make a procedural tree, which, it, which works out what a tree looks like. I give it a different number, it makes a slightly different tree. Great. Right? I don't need to hand animate all of that. Okay. Hacking and hack, um, and and um, sort of hex editing. Um, have any of you done any hex editing hacking before? We got one guy, two guys, three, four. Okay, so um, yeah, the guys in the back. Whee! Um, okay, so this is kind of you know the the ruder bit of this area where um, you know when I was sort of a teenager, some games were expensive, right? And actually, the worst it wasn't so much games because you know they were yeah. They weren't that bad. Pr some of the productivity software, certainly when I got to university, they were having like 5,000 US dollars to use this program. And I'm thinking, I'm a 20 year old guy. I don't have $5,000 in like 1993, 94. That's just a huge amount of money. Um, I, that was kind of my rent for the year. And it's kind of, no, I can't spend that on a program. Um, and you know, how they checked whether you had a valid license or not was kind of, you know, an if statement. And if you go and have a look in the actual code of software, sometimes you can find out what it's doing. Right? And if it's just doing, you know, a branching if statement, and if you're not valid, it takes you to the quit statement, and if you are valid, it continues. 
if I can go in there and just, you know, find that bit that says true or false, if I can change that in the executable file from a zero to a one, I can tell it that I'm a valid copy of this product and not some kind of invalid hack, right? I'm actually a valid copy. So I go in to the executable. So if we have a look at, like, so as a programmer, when you're programming, you know, stuff like this in C, right? So this is, so some C programming, I've used hash FE there just to, sort of, to make it more sort of easier to see what I'm talking about. Um, but here, you know, I've got a main, I do some tests, I write out a string, um, and I, I, can, I can kind of code this up. When I compile it, you get executable files. Now, um, oh, I'll go to the other executable directory. Where is it? Did it go over here? Nope, okay, so um, it's, I just get my executable. Um, so if I ever go and have a look at my, yeah, I've got a lot of files. Um, so in here, I have these uh, in release. I have some executables, right? So this, this hex edit exe and hex edit 254 exe, right? They're executables. I can open them in a hex editor and actually see the hex of the executable. Uh, in this case, I've compiled them in the least complex way with all of the optimization turned off and all of the other things turned off. Now, what I've got here is I compiled the file earlier with CC instead of FE. This is the actual piece of memory in the, he in the executable that is that comparison. Right? So, you know, as an 8-bit programmer, you could go in and say, OK, I, I, I understand the compiler's made some instructions. I can go and find those instructions. I can change those instructions. Um, and that was one of the typical ways of defeating sort of DRM, digital rights management, in the old days, right? So, that's, uh, so that was kind of that what we as hackers were doing. So the developers thought, OK, you know, we can't just leave bits of text exposed like this FE or, uh, and, and I can show you this, this works if you like. Um, what number would you, what two letters would you like me to put in here? AB? AB. AB. Um, so AB is kind of around about sort of 200 odd. Um, so if I compile that, build, so build solution, It'll compile that. It'll save hex edit, the hex edit exe. I can then go to my here and I can file refresh. Um, oh, I think it, F5 refresh. And there we go. That now says AB. Right? So this bit of memory is in the executable that number. And if I want to change it, I could change it in here and it would change the code. Now, you might say, okay, yeah, well, you know, that was, that was way back in the day, like a long time ago, right? No one does that anymore. No one, no one does if statements this simple to check validity. Except uh, about a year and a half ago, um, a guy looked at the bytecode of Android apps, right? Because it's in Java. He found the bytecode for the validity check where it would send off to, um, to Google to say, is this a purchased Android app? Right? And because Google gave people a standard tutorial on how to do that validity check, right? it was just a piece of standard code, people just copied it in, right? the standard copied in bit of code to do validity check. The guy then looks for the bytes, this going into the hex and finding the bytes, and saying, okay, how do I make it always return true? He found a way of doing that, wrote a program that would look into the hexadecimal, would look into this code, find the sequence that it was looking for, and then edit that to, to it always return true. And then he ran it on the downloaded file. He just downloaded a bunch of files from, from the Android market and to see if he could install them after running this patch. 30% of them were, able, were hacked because they just used the standard code. 
So this is not just something we were doing in the 80s that kind of has gone away. You can do this right now still, and a third of them were just using exactly the same bytecode. Okay? Now, what we do as developers is say, okay, yeah, that was the 80s. We've, game developers should have learned from that, right? One is, you do not use the standard code. Some bastard will go in, and he'll look at your standard code, and he'll hack it. What you do is you find new and interesting and alternative ways of doing things. So, um, like, John Carmack is, like, a programming freak, um, and one of the things that he did in one of his games was instead of returning the value, so if we go back to the code, instead of actually doing like a return th value and then using what gets returned, and I should not have done that, but instead of using what gets returned, what he did is he left it in the function, in the memory of the function, then just returned from the function. Now that memory, that locally scoped memory, is supposed to just disappear into the stack, right? It just goes back to being general program memory. But he knew Right? the system well enough that he could say, okay, I know that that old piece of calculation I did is now five blocks in memory below where I, my pointer is. So I'll just magically step the right distance into memory to get to that number and use that number. Right? Which means if you try and disassemble or try and understand how my code works, you will find me randomly sampling memories that's outside of the program. But, you know, I just happen to know that I've put a number there somewhere else, and I'll come back to it later, right? So kind of secret hiding stuff, right? Now, that's how 8-bit days, you then had programs where you would hack them, and they'd do other things like when you hack them, you would lose some abilities, but you wouldn't know that until, like, level 10, right? And you'd get there, and it would then kind of go, yeah. And you'd look kind of, kind of, we'll go on bulletin boards trying to find out why. And it was because, you know, you had a hacked version. It had detected it in level one and just let you, let you play for 10 levels to get you really engaged and nearly there and then just shut you down. Right? And that actually motivated you perhaps go and buy the game because then you might actually go get it finished. Um, and so in the 80s, we started doing that. Now, we still have to think about how do we manage security? And it's those lessons from the 8-bit and understanding this stuff and this is how it worked. When you look at 8-bit games, you could see it happening. Now, with so many compilers and, and the, so much happening between you and the, the metal, right, the actual computer, it's very hard to keep track of what's going on. So I'm getting low on my end of my, nearly the end of my time. Um, Last couple of things I was going to say is, in the 8-bit days, the limitations of doing things in 8-bit we actually used to be creative. Right? When you are forced to try and get something into the tiniest space possible, you come up with new solutions. Right? If you're just given a blank piece of paper and every colored pencil in the world and said, draw something amazing, it's kind of, eh? Right? If I said, you know, draw a unicorn being attacked by um, a feral rabbit with enormous teeth, you know, you've got something to start with then, right? You've actually got some constraints that allow you to make something, right? And the 8 bits, actually those constraints meant that we could create. And the same for audio, right? Some of the 8-bit audio is just fantastic. Right? Your modern audio, uh, it gets lost in the noise, but some of those tracks are the soundtrack of my childhood, and I remember them. Right? Um, and so using that creative inspiration. And so one of the things I'd say to you guys, even if you are thinking of making modern games, going back to the 8-bit games, going back to this, the, these kind of, you know, looking at how they did animation, understanding this reuse of things, understanding how they got in and hacked things, understanding how they used those limitations to create, I think as modern programmers, that is one way to try and get that inspiration to make something interesting and make something new. So those are the lessons I think you can take from the 8-bit days. And thank you very much. Hey, did anybody read this now? Any, uh, anybody can read this? Simon McCallum. Right? I actually, a friend of mine made this for me. So it is my name on my scarf in 
ASCII. So, okay, and if there are any questions, you can come up and ask me. I don't know if there's someone here at 4, 5, 30, 30, or can I ask, can people ask me questions, or do I have to run off stage? Some questions? Okay. So, any questions? Okay, well, cool. I'll be around um, till 4 o'clock, and um, yeah, have a good gathering.